back. It is Pushing the Limits on a Wednesday. So glad that you can join us and uh, coming up here at the top of the hour. Comedian Lindsay Glazer is going to be joining us in the studio. She's got a, a, a pretty cool gig at Wise Guys Comedy Club and also uh, recording an album uh, with, with these two shows on Friday and Saturday. So we'll be talking uh, to her coming up here in just a few at the top of the hour. we got UNLV's athletic director, Eric Harper, that will be joining us in hour number two. want to tell you guys about my favorite gaming bar in Las Vegas. You know I was at Jackson's bar and grill yesterday thomas moscow joining us in the studio as well and i hit a straight flush can you believe that yes a straight flush very rare are and you serious a straight flush and i'll tell you why i hit a straight flush because chris Wynn was nowhere near me that's why <laughs> he wasn't even in the bar he wasn't in the vicinity i went with my friend andrew we went down there and had a probably the best blt sandwich i've ever had the food there is so great they got some new slot machines installed there. And well, they have a good payout structure over there at Jackson. They like, do. They don't rape the customers to no. lose, 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 lose. No. Like, it, I, you I get the straight flush. I've been very lucky there recently, and I hit a straight flush. And uh, they got some great promotions in, in December, by the way. Every Sunday, you earn 200 points. You get $50 in free play. Mondays, you earn 200 points. You get a free bottle of wine. Who doesn't like that? And Tuesdays, 10 time points all day. Some restrictions do apply. It is awesome. And I had some luck there yesterday, so please check it out. My favorite gaming bar in town, Jackson's Bar and Grill, located at Flamingo and Jones. All right, Thomas, it seems like, you know, while there is a lot of great police work out there, and I think we both agree, um, you know, most officers do a great job and, and they're heroes and they work hard every day to protect and serve. Um, there's a situation out here in Jacksonville, the Jacksonville Police Department, that is very, very troubling. So... New re released body camera footage appears to show an unidentified Jacksonville, Florida uh, officer uh, shooting and killing a man holding an axe after refusing an order to put it down and attempting to talk to the officer. To give you a little bit of background on this, police received a call, mentally ill man hiding out in the woods with a very small axe. He wasn't really threatening anybody. He wasn't. Now, he does have a police record, but that's that should be academic to this situation. So a police officer finds him in the woods, takes immediately takes his gun out, points it towards him, and, and gives him several commands. Put the axe down. Put the axe down. Uh, the guy does respond and say no. In no point in that video is the guy lunging towards the officer. In no point in that video, no reasonable person would say that that officer's life was in danger. Now, if that guy threw the axe at him, totally different ballgame. If that guy even moved towards him in a threatening way, totally different ballgame. None of that stuff happened. Uh, the officer, and this only took about 10 or 15 seconds, right? Several commands. You saw the video as I did. Then the officer shoots him in the head and kills him. Now, obviously, if you have a weapon in your hand, any type of weapon, and an officer gives you a command, you put the weapon down. But that doesn't justify, we're not talking about a gun pointed at an officer. That would be a different, we're talking about an ax. To me, this video does not constitute the right of that officer to do what he did and kill this man. And here's the worst part about this story. That officer is back on the streets within the Jacksonville Police Department. He's working again, and we don't even know his name. Well, they found no wrongdoing when they did their internal investigation. So, Thomas, you've covered situations. If there's no wrongdoing, you're going back on the street. How, though? How is it? Give me your opinions on this from start to finish. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I, you know, I watched the body cam video, and when he shot, I just said, dang, that was quick. Dang, that was quick. That and was I'm a big good. advocate. I've done a lot of officer-involved shooting reviews here in Vegas, and I'm usually the one saying, man, you should have shot him sooner. But that's our Vegas officers. They wait, they wait too long sometimes. They put themselves in jeopardy. Uh, but this is one where I said, man, you went really, really quick. And I saw a former officer get interviewed down there about the Jacksonville shooting, and he said – Look, in his opinion, uh, you, you try to de-escalate a little bit, try to talk to the guy a little bit. There's two officers on scene if you watch the body cam. There's another officer with them right there. And so they come in, and what it came down to me when I looked at it from the body cam is this officer already had it in his mind that if he got any resistance or there was any show of a threatening gesture whatsoever, that he was going to go deadly force on him. And that's not necessarily what we want our officers to do so yeah it was i'm not going to say that it was completely unjustified you know under the once the guy raises the axe up i don't think an officer needs to wait till it gets thrown but man it was quick and especially when you hear in context the guy goes man listen bro boom and he was shot right in the head and uh yeah i just think that officer had it in his mind you know 
to to do what he did, and I think it was quick. So, do you think that he should have been charged with something? No, I. You know, look, I don't think it rises to that level. You don't. No, it doesn't rise to the level of you're going to criminally prosecute this guy. I mean, what you're watching is it is offensive that he went so quickly on the guy, but the guy did raise a deadly weapon above his head. He did disobey commands, but man, it was a quick shoot. It was a real quick shoot. Uh, but you, that was a tough one. That was a tough one. You know, I don't agree with what the officer did. I don't. Do you believe that he should have been fired? Let's forget about even the legal ramifications. You've already said well, you don't I, believe that. But. Well, I'll say this. Like, look, there's two things going. One is, should you be criminally prosecuted as an officer going into a situation like that? The other one is, internally, what's the police department doing? And for them to say no wrongdoing on his part, uh, I think their procedures have got to be a little bit more strict than that in that department. If not, they need to clean up their procedures. You know, here in Las Vegas, uh, there's a lot of times where you have righteous shoots by officers that no one would even question. And like mm -hmm. I said, I would watch the video and say, you should have gone sooner. You put everybody in jeopardy, not going sooner on him. Those officers sometimes really get reamed because they have all these internal procedures of you need to do everything mm -hmm. in order to create distance. I mean, that's one thing the officer did wrong. He doesn't create distance. He goes as close as he can to the guy. Yeah. Like you see, he has the ax, start backing away from him. There's only so far he can throw this thing. Keep your eye on him. Get the other officer, wait for backup. Do all these things before you just try to take somebody's life. So, yeah, I do. I disagree with Jacksonville just exonerating him completely internally as no wrongdoing. Here's where I disagree with you. Uh, and this is just an opinion, right? Not nothing legally, uh, just my opinion. If an officer's life is not in jeopardy, clearly this is the case here. That officer's life was never in jeopardy. As I said, if the guy attempted to throw the axe, shoot him. If the guy was lunging toward him with a weapon, like an ax, shoot him. A hundred percent. I'm on board with that. He didn't do any of those things. If an officer's life is not in jeopardy and they use deadly force, in my personal opinion, this is an opinion, they should be charged with a crime. Now, whether it be, I'm not going to say attempted murder, whether that be involuntary manslaughter, whatever, I think that officer needs to be charged with something because I think it sets a bad precedence. Well, the officer shouldn't have done it, but we're not going to charge him with a crime. I'm not saying the officer got out of his squad car and said, boy, I can't wait to kill somebody today. That's it, not kind of looks like that might have been maybe, in his head. Maybe but they've been searching for this guy earlier in the day. I think this officer so, knew I mean, who this guy was. Yeah. Oh, I think this guy's known in the community. I mean, I'm just going to speculate on what I've read so far. Yep. But they got a 911 call earlier that this guy was out there in this woods. Police went, tried to find him. They couldn't. Get another 911 call later. He's cutting the power to the house, whatever it is. And look, I think there, part of it was like a little bit of Charlie Bronson. Like, Let me I'm going to clean up context. the community right here. Let me give you a little context on who this guy was. This guy, Mahan, who was killed. Uh, he does have a lengthy history of encounters with the law. So let's talk about that, even though it shouldn't have any bearing. Well, on this. he does have a prior conviction, if you know who he is, for having a firearm when he's not supposed also to. Also armed robbery, previously sentenced to prison after a conviction of, of being a felon in possession of a firearm, correct. He was arrested a year ago after an alleged attempted carjacking incident and pleaded no contest to resisting arrest. He served 30 days in jail. Okay, yeah, obviously this guy is mentally deranged. So, he's, so he's you take that, so let, let's just speculate a little bit more. Let's say they got a 911 call, they knew who it is, they knew what this guy's history is. They go, look, prior violent conviction for armed robbery, he's known to have firearms after he had a felony conviction he wasn't supposed to, and you only see the axe there. But in the officer's mind, he's coming up on a guy who possibly could have firearms there, has mental health issues, has an arrest from just, I think, a year prior uh, where he was resisting officers or something like that. So when you start taking everything in context, you're like, okay, now what's really going through that officer's head when he hits that scene? But the video itself, no, you create space. The guy didn't seem like he was being aggressive at that point. You try to talk to him a little bit. Don't just bark at him the whole time. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't, it's a, it's, it's not a clear case of like, you don't prosecute. I know what you're saying. And if you got that in front of a jury, which is the way I always analyze every case, whether I'm the defense side of the prosecution, I look at it real quick. I go, what would a jury think when they watch this video? They're going to think the same thing you're thinking. And then I'm thinking, right. Which right. is, it was quick. And, Looked unjustified. He right. definitely wasn't scared for his life. He wasn't personally scared. I mean, I thought it was comical a little bit at the end when the other officer goes, you good? He goes, oh, yeah, I'm good. It's like, yeah, you're good. Yeah, you're good. Of course good. you're good. This guy's you, weren't even good. you weren't scared one bit. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no medical help uh, immediately either. I noticed that, but I mean, obviously maybe they just looked at him and they figured, yeah, well, well no, he called in for medical. He right did call away. Medical. Yeah. He said, we need medical right away. But the way he had the gun trained on him, I don't think the headshot was accidental. It looked like, looked like he was taking aim. He was pretty locked in for the headshot on that. Uh, as soon as he raised, aren't you trained to shoot center mass? You're not trained to shoot somebody in the head. Mm. I thought, I thought uh, police training was tr you're trained to shoot center mass. I thought, well, the reason why you shoot center mass is because you don't want to miss, right? You want to do some damage. You want to stop somebody. Uh, you know, this, this, this is a tough case. If he was prosecuted, I wouldn't say, oh, this is a crazy prosecution to happen. But he wasn't even, but, he wasn't even, he's, he's back on the force. He wasn't even fired. Administrative leave while they which went is, ahead and looked into everything. Which is normal protocol with any officer. I'll, I'll tell you this. This isn't the kind of, and you know, they're protecting his identity. I don't know if you knew this. But they are. Marcy's law is a, a law that protects victims in cases. So if you're a victim in a case, your stuff will not be made public to the newspapers and things because because you're a victim. Down in Florida, they actually got a Supreme Court ruling down there allowing Marcy's law to be applied to police officers and shootings like this as if he is now the victim in the case. So now his identity is protected. Listen, the Thomas, public. I understand that, but this also goes both ways. And I will defend the officer in the Ferguson shooting, right, with Michael Brown. Michael Brown charged towards the officer, completely different case. The evidence proved that. Witnesses even said that Brown charged toward the officer. That officer did absolutely nothing wrong. And, you know, he was just attacked, 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 and his name is out there. And I don't even know if that guy's even an officer anywhere any anymore. His life was ruined because some stupid kid or young adult, whatever you want to call Michael Brown, commits a strong arm robbery gets out of there, and then thinks it's okay to assault a police officer. That's a death wish when you do that. I defended that officer throughout the whole thing. I didn't see any evidence that supported the fact that that was a bad shooting. And yet, one of my biggest criticisms of Barack Obama was the way he handled that situation. Bringing members of his administration to the funeral of Michael Brown, Barack Obama made a very big mistake there. That was disgusting. That was wrong. This is not wrong. That officer's name should be public. And it should be public because people should know if you're dealing with this guy, you better be careful with this police officer. Well, that was going to be my thing to you is as a member, just a member of the community. Yeah, you want to know. You don't want a quick trigger officer out there. It's of not course even not. I want to know who he is, but just. I agree. You know, the fact that he's back on the force, he had a really quick trigger that day. Agree. And yep. it seemed like he had a decision made in his mind when he got out of that car. Of what he was going to do if something happened and uh at, but thomas at a minimum even if what you know some might say that this isn't criminal what this police officer did at a minimum it's horrendous policing horrendous you are supposed to de-escalate situations he didn't do that he did the opposite of it he didn't even bother talking to this guy Put it down. Put it down. He wasn't holding a gun. If he's holding a, a, a gun, then that would be different. You don't want to rationalize with a guy who's holding a gun. Put the gun down. Put the gun down. Fine. Shoot. But even then, you could say if a guy doesn't point a gun at an officer, you, you probably shouldn't shoot. But that's, you know, that's a gun. That's different. We're talking about a little axe. Could it harm somebody? Could it kill somebody? Yes. Not if you're 30 feet away. The guy's not a, what do you call that? The, the axe throwers? Like, well, let's play a little devil's advocate here. How, are you sure in that split second moment? That that officer didn't know, is that an axe or is that a firearm that he's raising up really quick? I'm pretty sure he knew that that was not. It's a, a gun. very split second decision well, though when you think about well, it, right? You, you're 30 I mean, feet away, a guy lifts up something metal. You're you're already going into a situation knowing that yeah, but this I'm, could be a possibly armed guy, possibly violent, possibly mentally deranged. Uh, but I think when he approached, he just say, "Drop the axe, right? Drop the yeah, axe." Drop so the no, axe. He, he knew it was saying. he knew it was an axe. So that that takes that theory away. I understand what you're saying if you didn't say that. He knew it was an ax. He knew his life wasn't in jeopardy, and he decided to take somebody's life anyway. Listen, this guy was a scumbag. Uh, I'm not going to, uh, but I go back to George Floyd for a moment. Completely different case. Well, you know, now but, that I'm thinking about this, the Jacksonville shooting a little bit more. You know, maybe he needed to wait one more second for to see if the motion was going to come for the arm to come back in a throwing motion. That's different. But yep. do we put that on the officer? The more I'm thinking about it, do we put that on the officer to wait for that throwing motion to happen? I mean, once somebody raises it up, the only bad part about this really was how the guy's tone of voice when he goes, man, look, bro. Look, dude. Yeah. yeah. You know, it was just yeah. so it was a very peaceful tone that he was taking. 
with the situation. Listen, let me be very clear, though. Um, Dang, it was I, quick. I, it was. I, <laughs> I, I, apparently, this guy was mentally deranged. With that being said, he's a career criminal. I don't feel bad for him. Very stupid. I know that people that are mentally ill, you shouldn't call them stupid. When an officer tells you to put something down, you put it down. Mentally ill or not, very stupid. He did this to himself. With that being said, I don't feel bad for him. One less career criminal on the planet, but officers cannot be judge and jury. That was a bad officer-involved shooting. That was bad policing. Any reasonable person would and, say And that. I think Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, office they kind of messed up on this because what you're trying to do is instill trust with the public. Right. And when you when you really get fully behind the officer's conduct in this situation, you're you're not you're building distrust with the public on that ground. And so that's why, you know, here in Vegas and what the FBI wants these law enforcement jurisdictions to do is be open and transparent with Jacksonville is they release the body cam. Right. Uh, but I love if you go on their website, the way they release the body cam, they really pause when the axe gets brought up and they zoom in and they put an arrow and they go axe, you know, yeah. for like three seconds. They pause the video to like show like there's a deadly weapon here when I think the right move politically to build trust with the community is to say. No, we did find wrongdoing. He violated internal policies of how we're supposed to handle these situations. We're going to look further into this, provide more training to officers on this, and we're going to use this as a learning experience because we don't want our officers to go deadly force on somebody so quickly like this situation. But what they've done here is they've kind of sanctioned it. Explain to me why it took so long for them to release this body camera and why did they even release it in the first place if – they didn't think he did anything wrong. Well, part of it is they they have the cover of this the internal machinery of doing their own internal investigation. You know, they have a they have there's a there's a segment in every police force that investigates the officers and the officers are in, on administrative leave because they're potential criminal defendants. They're investigating the officers for committing a crime there. And then there's a separate unit that comes in and investigates them for violation of internal policies. Mm. Uh, and so they can say, well, it's been, it, this is why it took so long. But best practices, if you're living by the gold standard of what the FBI wants our police organizations to do to make sure the community's not uh, out there rioting in the streets over things, you do it quick. The quicker you get it out to the public, the better. You know, right. when it takes this long, this happened in April. I think it was April. So we're looking at you know six, seven months before the video gets released. Mm -hmm. you're, that's another thing. You're not building trust with the community. And that's what it's all about, transparency. Isn't it interesting? You know, I remember a um, black girl was shot by a police officer. She had a teenage girl. She had a knife in her hand. You remember that case? Mm -hmm. Completely justified shooting. That officer probably saved lives that day. Good policing, what he did there. But isn't it interesting how within that same 24-hour period, they released the body camera footage? when it's so obvious that a police officer did nothing wrong. But then when there's a possibility that officer might have done some wrong doing, like in this case, they wait months and months well, before they release. You know, them. like I said, you know, you delay things to let it kind of come out of the media's eye. We do that in cases that are high profile, shootings that are high profile. You let the media kind of die down and then you release the stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, just like, you know, that, that goes with anything. So we're, we can speculate it's a nefarious motive so that they're right. not getting flack. And that's why those things take longer yeah. to get released. Yeah, no no question. And it's unfortunate. And, uh, you know, listen, I feel for this man's family. But this police officer, uh, I'm, I'm just going to say it, he got off scot-free. Forget about even from a legal perspective. How he is still a police officer and how he is still on the streets today is uh, mesmerizing to me. These are the issues I have with law enforcement. Yes, I am pro-police. But these are the circumstances that make certain precincts look really bad. This guy should not be a cop. He should not be on the streets. You can make the argument that he should be prosecuted uh, for a crime. I know you don't think it rises to that level. I respect that. But at a minimum, the guy shouldn't be a cop anymore. And well, I also think the community down there is not going to be clamoring for criminal prosecution of this guy. Because what you're looking at is here's how it would have played out if they did things the right way and they just yep. arrested this guy. The guy would have been charged with criminal trespass, which is a very minor violation. Maybe some possession, they'd search his little camp, his homeless camp right there. Maybe they'd find some drugs. Maybe they'd even find a firearm. But uh, at, at best, destruction of property, he had cut the power to a residence. Look, this guy pretty much is going to be back out on the streets pretty quickly mm -hmm. down there with what we're doing. And he's going to be out there kind of being a menace to the community. Right. And so that's what it comes down to is I don't think the community is down there clamoring for it. And if we're going to well, let's 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 bring the race issue up in this, you know, we're dealing with a white guy that got shot. Right. OK, so it, 
this isn't this uh oh the police are are shooting black people indiscriminately so there's not that political uh element to it as well right and so yeah i, I mean i get it but like i said I, I think that cop went in there he had a little charlie bronson in him and we don't necessarily want that he knew he knew who this guy was he probably had uh, dealt with him before that wouldn't surprise me either he knew probably oh, this guy was well known in the police station yeah. just always yeah, always causing trouble. Yeah, I, I, that's surprise, probably the situation here. But again, uh, police officers can't be judge and jury, and this was wrong. This isn't Judge yeah. Dread. Yeah, no, no question about that. Any other um, high-profile cases or cases that you've taken up over the course of the last uh, you know month or two since you've been here that you'd, you'd want to discuss? Any interesting cases or cases that uh, uh, you you would want to share that that have happened here locally? No, nothing. You know, I have client confidentiality. Oh, that's Anybody right. calls me, that's you know, important. if, if you hire me, that? you know, I'm not going to be on the radio putting your business out there. <laughs> uh, just, just know that. Yeah, it's attorney client privilege on any case. Who cares about that? That's not taken. important. Just, just talk about all your clients and their personal situations. <laughs> that, 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 that's what I think we should do. Uh, nothing really new on the Tillis front, right? Um, he's obviously behind bars still. And I think there was a stay in his case. And uh, I, I don't know what, what more, um, defense you could have with this guy allegedly you know from what i've heard is that the murder is actually on video uh which i clearly do not want to see um and then we uh, another high profile case that i'll bring is this idaho uh the murder of those four college kids in this home and there are no leads it's like there's nothing they have a picture of this car this white sedan i think they have no idea who killed these four individuals and it's such a bizarre story because there was no screaming or yelling, the neighbors said, and, and you're, they used a knife, the perpetrator. You would think that there would be a fight. and It's just bizarre circumstances, and these four young individuals are dead. It's a tragedy, and police don't seem to know who did it. They well, have no if, idea. If you ever get into the, the serial killer, uh, I know people are interested in serial killers and what they do. Uh, look, when you don't have – like in TELUS, there was all this motive. So you could kind of point the finger at who would have a reason to do this. But if a serial killer comes out and there's really no connection to their victims and they actually are a little bit methodical and play it out a certain way and they cover their tracks, man, there's so many unsolved murders. Uh, there are serial killers out there that, you know, people have no idea who they are. They've been operating for decades sometimes. But so you think that there might not have been a connection. There's a strong possibility that. Well, this... I'm just saying when you have no leads, yeah. it's because you're having trouble finding anybody that has a motive to do it or someone who did have a motive. You're exonerating them pretty quickly through your Obviously, investigation. Obviously people within the community are very scared. Uh, you know, somebody taking a knife and killing four college students and the families want answers. Rightfully so. It's a terrible tragedy. We're now a month out. We're also at the 10 year anniversary of Sandy Hook. And I saw some interviews yesterday uh, on CNN with those individuals that survived, that were not killed, that were in the school during the shooting, that were little children. They're now uh, teenagers, you know, 16, 17, 18 years old. And it's interesting. They're all talking about that day and how it changed their life forever. Um, it's amazing that it's been 10 years, right, since that day. But, uh, you know, not a lot has changed when it comes to gun control, uh, and that's a whole nother topic to bring up. But, you know, these shootings come and go. And it doesn't seem like uh, things are getting much better in this country when it comes to these these shootings. But uh, it was just weird you know, and interesting to see they were seven, eight years old. That would be a great a subject of a documentary to follow these people 10 years later. Wouldn't it another be? Another 10 years after that. I was thinking kind of about see, that. Yeah. You know, how that trauma played out in their life. Yeah, and it's interesting hearing from them now 17, 18 years old. I mean, I still hear from people that are uh, – you know, close to my age when it comes to Columbine, I'm a few years older than them, but um, how it transcends their life and, and they have to probably talk about it every day and uh, it shouldn't define them, but um, yeah, very sad. Uh, anyway, Thomas, good to see you back in here, man. I appreciate you coming yeah, back. Yeah, I in hope studio. to be back a little bit more often. I'd love to. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to have you in here next Just week. Been busy. We've been busy. That's a good thing. When a Business lawyer says good, there's a lot of crime going on in Vegas. Well, that's you know, not good, but <laughs> but, but you guys are not guilty. In my book, you're not guilty. You know, so yeah, you know, you need someone to work these prosecutions. Yes, and you're one of the best in the business as a DUI attorney. Give oh, out I that information that. before uh, that. before we let you go. Uh, give out that information. If people want to.